Hey everyone, Humphrey here with Router Gods. We're following up on our sales engineer series of videos and we're going to cover why I quit Cisco. So about one month ago, actually a little bit more than a month ago on August 7th, I left Cisco and flew over to Thailand the very next day. We are going to cover why exactly why I left Cisco. We're going to do things. We're going to talk about things like the money, salary and RSUs. We're going to talk about advancement opportunities. We're going to talk about a little bit about Groundhog Day. Things got a little bit repetitive and how that played into my decision. Product lead times, innovation or maybe not so much innovation. Uh, one important question also is fun. Was it fun? Did it become fun or did it become not fun? And then we will end it with time uh, one of the big reasons was quitting to take a break and that's one big reason why I'm here in Thailand. And then we will also talk about why I waited one month or more than one month to do this video. When I made the first video, you know, as soon as I landed, I made the video of all the things I would talk about and there were a couple private messages and emails and also YouTube comments asking why I quit. And I purposely waited uh, a month or so because you never want to make that type of video right after you quit because it can be a little emotional. It can look a little bit, you don't have the perspective or the, you know, yeah, the perspective of waiting those couple weeks and let everything die down and calm, you know, everything calms down. And then you can make a, a more informed, more reasonable video. It's been nice uh, for the past month except for a couple days I've been able to wake up without any alarm, just wake up whenever I get eight hours of sleep. I don't, I don't think I've ever, I mean, it's been a long time since I've gotten eight plus hours of sleep more than a couple days in a row. So now it's, it's been a couple weeks of that and it's, yeah, it's, it's been great. Being able to go through a meal, whether it be breakfast, lunch, or dinner, without constantly looking at your phone and worrying whether you're gonna miss an appointment, the WebEx is coming up, I've gotta check WebEx Teams, I've gotta check Outlook, et cetera. So, so that's, that's been great to get that perspective. And we should say, yes, we are gonna talk about the reasons why I left Cisco, but I will always say, and I will continue to say that if you get a chance to join Cisco, and you do not have a big name under your resume, or you don't have a recognizable name under your resume, you should absolutely take that opportunity to, to join Cisco. You're going to meet a lot of great people. And yes, for the most part, the vast majority of people I worked with at Cisco have been, have been awesome. Now, one interesting thing is when you leave Cisco, and you announce it on LinkedIn. There's a, a very stereotypical way of leaving Cisco is freaking everyone takes a picture of their badge. You know, I did it too, right? You take a picture of your badge, some will, will put the picture of the badge on top of the laptop, your company laptop, and then you announce it on, on LinkedIn. Your LinkedIn starts also getting more view, you, your feed will start getting more views about people who quit. It's some type of weird algorithm, right? And so my feed just kept getting amplified, people quitting here and there, basically every day. And a comment was made, wow, so many people quit Cisco, uh, mass exodus and all that. And I think it looks a lot worse than it really is. Yes, I mean, people are leaving Cisco, but it, it seems a lot worse than it is because you got 60, 70,000 employees at Cisco, whatever the number is, I, I haven't kept up, but let's say it's 70,000. Uh, employees. When you have 70,000 employees, yeah, just if if it's 1%, 2%, 3% attrition rate per year, that's still a lot of people. Uh, whatever the real attrition rate is, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, one thing that commonly pops up about people leaving Cisco is um, you get the internal emails and you get something saying, there'll usually be a sentence, this has been the toughest thing the toughest decision I've ever made. Yeah, super tough decision. Uh, I will tell you, for me, it was a long decision, but it wasn't a tough decision. For me, it was an easy decision. 
And we'll get into now the reasons, right? So, but, but yeah, easy decision for me. Let's start off with the money and we'll combine the money with a salary and RSUs, which are the stock options. Now, not what you think. Yes, I do have a lot of former coworkers who have left Cisco and gone to other companies and they've gotten an instant, I mean, instant 15, 25, 30% raise. In one case, it was basically a 50% raise for, for a certain person. So yes, I've gotten coworkers who have left for, for better salaries and uh, Cisco as a whole, it seems to me, and this is just a grunt talking, a peon talking, it does seem to me that that Cisco was a little bit slow in adjusting their pay to the market because yeah, when, when you got coworkers leaving, they're getting instant 30% raise, that's pretty good. Uh, the raise could be, uh, in, in many of those cases, the, the raises, the increase was just salary alone. And then the RSUs that the other company gave was like a massive bonus by itself as well. But uh, yeah, salary, just talking salary, quite a, quite a big raise. Now for me, the salary and RSUs, not a big deal, was not necessarily a factor in my case. Now, that isn't to say if, if Cisco had offered me like $20,000 more or $30,000 more or $10,000 or you know, just a humongous amount of stock options, uh, is not to say it wouldn't have mattered to me at all. I mean, hey, if you want to throw 20K at me, great. But in, in terms of my leaving, not really a factor. And the reason is, a couple of reasons. I have very low expenses. I have, uh, yeah, I mean, my superpower is I'm single and I have no kids. So when you're single and you have no kids, nothing, right? In Singapore, I didn't have a car. No biggie. Uh, and if you look at what I'm wearing, I'm basically a walking Uniqlo catalog, right? Shirt is Uniqlo, undershirt is Uniqlo, pants, boxers, my, probably too much information. My socks are Uniqlo. So I, I'm like a walking Uniqlo person. I don't wear any fancy jewelry. I don't buy anything fancy. I guess other than the Mac stuff, the, the Apple stuff would be fancy, but that's pretty much it, right? I'm rocking the free Cisco backpack. So yeah, I'm not flashy. I guess I do spend quite a bit of money traveling, but once again, I don't really stay in like that fancy of hotels and I eat like pretty normal. I'm not, I'm not boozing it up. I'm not, you know, no cigarettes, no, not too much alcohol. So my expenses are extremely low. And because they're extremely low, I have saved a lot. So I have saved up a, a really big nest egg. I've already bought my house. The house is in Arizona. It's rented out. Thank you to my renter who has been totally awesome. And so, yeah, I mean, in terms of everything that I've, all the big stuff that I've wanted to buy, no big deal. I'm not saving up for kids to go to college. And yeah, money, I mean, that's the reason why money is, is not a factor. Now, if you're someone looking at quitting your job and you have a family and you have a house and mortgage and you have kids, then, then yeah, I mean, don't be as cavalier as I am. In, in bailing and not caring about money. But in, in my terms, I have enough money saved up to where basically for five to 10 years, depending on the country, I could just hang out, right? And we'll talk about the hanging out portion later. But yeah, money for me, n not a factor or a very, very little factor. Uh, let's talk about advanced, advancement opportunities, promotions, becoming a manager, was that a factor? Uh, for me, yes, I, I am interested in becoming a manager somewhere, a leader somewhere, but I chose, this wasn't really a factor at, at Cisco, especially in, in this particular area, because the way I looked at it, my quality, quality of life would have gone down quite a bit if I were to become a, an SE manager. And the reason for that is the time zones involved in dealing with stuff, the marginal increase in pay, the extra hours I would have to work, and, and also whether I would have a autonomy to do certain decisions. We won't get into to like the nitty gritty details, but basically, would I be more of a manager or would I be more of a leader? 
So I was looking, I'm looking at leadership. I'm not looking at management. And so management is rules are coming from above and I need to enact those rules and, and uh, put those rules to, to use. And yeah, I just didn't see any point to it. So uh, yeah, quality of life would have gone down for maybe a little bit increase in pay and the workload it just would have just been immense. And it, it didn't seem to be a fit at Cisco. So the advancement opportunities for me didn't make sense and, and they weren't, weren't really, really there. Let's talk about uh, whether every day was becoming basically Groundhog Day. So this was, you know, you've done enough uh, you've done everything that you've wanted to accomplish, all the big things that you want to accomplish, and now you're just doing the same thing over and over and over and over. And was, you know, basically, did it become too easy? And so I would say yes. This, you know, after about, after six years at Cisco and five of those years at Cisco Meraki, yeah, I mean, you, you know, you closed the big deals, You've learned the product. You've given the same dashboard demo 50 billion times. You've, you've told the same stories. And now you're getting into a Groundhog Day situation. The challenges become fewer and fewer. And yeah, now you're just earning a paycheck, basically. Now, for some people, if you need the paycheck, yes, then whether it's Groundhog Day or not, you need the money and you can't do anything about it. But for me... Yeah, that, that definitely was a factor. Uh, also, another way I look at it is when you're in the situation of you're just doing your, making your paycheck and you're doing things over and over and over, and you're trying to find things to do. You got to look at it is, or the way I look at it as, if I'm no longer growing in the position, I need to step aside and give someone younger a chance at my spot. And also, I need, I look at it, as, it's almost my duty to give someone younger who's not earning as much money. So let's say hypothetically I'm making 200 to 225K US a, a year. If we've got someone who's making 150 total compensation or 125 total compensation and they want my spot, I should step aside or I should leave to give that person a shot. I never want to be that person that when I came in, I was looking at certain people go, man, that guy's been here for 15 years, 20 years. Why doesn't he just leave? Like he's just taken up a spot, right? And so now the situation is flipped. I am potentially that guy who is not leaving. So yeah, Groundhog Day, everything's going you know, over and over, every day the same, just no challenge maybe at that point I should be the one to step aside and give the other folks a chance, especially if I don't need the money, then it kind of makes sense. And I think it's, it's almost like a, a corporate responsibility, a social responsibility to, to do that. <laughs> Product lead times, oh boy. Product lead times, um, I guess we won't hold back on this one. My job is to sell a box and great, I sell the box, but now I can't ship the box. Now, of course, <laughs> uh, eventually those problems will fix themselves and, and product lead times will, will come down. But yeah, it's, it definitely plays a factor if you sell something and then the customer can't get it for nine months or a year or whenever. A uh, little, little disheartening. And you also think, like, how do you fix that in the future? Like, okay, we, we can... We'll bring the factories online. We'll bring more factory production lines online. We'll move the production. You know, we do all the tricks that you can do to fix the, the lead times. But at the end of the day, it's a box. At the end of the day, what happens in the future? Another war, another COVID, monkeypox, whatever, right? So yeah, that definitely played a factor in my decision is long product lead times and when you're selling a physical box, it's gonna happen again, or that's the way I look at it uh, is, um, yeah, it, 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 it's gonna happen again, and, and what do we do about it? Maybe the best solution in my, in maybe the best solution 
in my viewpoint for 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 me is to maybe find another product to sell that isn't a physical physical box innovation so when i first started there was a lot of innovation a lot of new products a lot of features you know your product is the king of the hill and then as the years go by the it's just the inertia of the you know your product is selling more and more and you can't innovate as fast because there are more lines of code, there's more products, you don't want to risk burning something or you don't want to risk having worse stability because now you have really, really big customers like hospitals and governments and stuff like that. So it's a classic case of innovator's dilemma. Great, great book. It was a basically a required book when I started at Meraki. I was told to read it before interviewing at Meraki. And I, I don't know how many Cisco people have actually read this book. If you haven't, you probably should. Um, yeah, but innovation, it felt like in, in the later part of my career at Cisco is, uh, yeah, it um, just wasn't there. Uh, another factor that led me to my decision was, you know, when you have a couple years of Cisco under your belt and you want to go somewhere else, it's a big deal. Like, oh, cool. You know, you survived like three, four years, five years at Cisco. You know, that's, that's good, right? Uh, it's kind of like when you look at a resume and someone has, let's say, three years, four years of Google or Facebook or a fang company under your belt. It, it looks really good. But in my viewpoint for, for Cisco is, you know, I was hired in 2015. It's now 2022. I've been there six plus years coming up on, on seven. And yeah, the difference between six years and seven years and eight years, you know, does that extra year help me or does it actually hurt me? Uh, so that played a factor in my viewpoint, the types of jobs that I'm going for, the types of jobs I'm, I'm interested in, the careers I'm interested in. The extra year at Cisco didn't make sense and in my viewpoint would start being counterproductive in terms of it would actually start hurting me from the viewpoint of if I were to go to a Google, hypothetically speaking, or if I were to go to company XYZ that was working on machine learning or something really crazy, um, you know, having 10 years of Cisco under my belt might start looking bad, right? And I think you've seen it before if you're in the tech field. Maybe if you're looking at a resume and it has, I don't know, uh, what, what type of company can we use? I don't want to pick on, yeah, Avaya. Let's pick on Avaya, right? So let's say you have uh, 15 years under your belt at Avaya and you try to go to uh, you know, a, a dot com type of company, that starts looking a little weird, right? So that definitely played a part in my decision. Okay, let's talk about fun. Yeah, so if you have money saved up and money isn't a factor, you know, one of the things I kept asking myself every week was, is it? fun and that in the beginning yeah i mean when i when i started at meraki it was great right people are great products great it's fun i'm i'm kicking ass and in as you start getting towards the later part of your career and as cisco meraki gets further further absorbed into cisco and that's another we, we knew that was going to happen right it was, it, was, it was one day you would wake up and Meraki was no longer green. Meraki is just a different shade of blue, right? We knew that was going to happen. But as more of that happened, it became less fun. And so, yeah, that was a big part of my consideration. Actually, I think that's probably the main thing, right? Is, is it flipped from, you know, was this fun to maybe was it not fun? And yeah, you got the money already. Maybe, maybe it's time to leave. And then coinciding with that, COVID is winding down, hopefully, right? 
that COVID nightmare is winding down. Travel is opening up. Countries are opening up. Heck, I'm in Chiang Mai right now, and it's, it's been great. Taiwan's opening up. Japan one day will, will hopefully fully open up without the tours. And um, I just was thinking about, you know, let's take a break. Let's, let's take a six month, one year, two year, who knows, right? Let's, let's uh, just bail and take a break. And now you have all this time to, to catch up on your reading, to visit countries, to learn chess, to, to learn Thai. Um, I mean, it's been great. Yesterday I was in a grab and I had maybe 80 to 90% of my conversation in Thai with the, with the grab driver. Now I think he was playing along. He was slowing down his speech, um, which I don't know exactly if that's the right thing to do. If you're learning to speak a language, if someone like really slows down to, to help, to quote unquote help you out, or whether someone should just speak normal and to force you to speak fast. But uh, it felt really good to have 80 to 90% of my uh, talk with him in Thai. And that kind of kicked in because I spent a greater part of a, a month uh, here and just trying to speak Thai, just trying to speak Thai and learning Thai and learning all the slang and the grammar. Google Translate is up on my laptop all the time and it's been great, right? So taking time off or quitting to take time off to take a break uh, was, a, was a huge part of my decision as well. So those are the reasons that came into play that, that went through my mind in leaving Cisco. And if you've recently left Cisco or, you know, if you've not, maybe not that recent, but maybe a year ago or two years ago, and you have your personal reason, put it in the comments. I'm always interested in, in hearing that. But um, yeah, for now I am taking a break and uh, who knows what will happen in the future. It's, it's actually been good because now I can focus on taking a position or maybe taking a position somewhere and it's not for money's sake. I can look at the product, I can look at the company and join a company in a product that I really, really believe in and the team I really believe in. And yes, hopefully they pay me a decent salary, but not even, not even worry about the, the salary or, or it, it's very low on the totem pole. And that's a pretty good position to be in. But I will end with, once again, you, you may think this is a very negative video uh, against Cisco, and it's not. It's just, you know, here, here are the things that were my, came into my decision matrix, if you could call it that. But I will end with, if you have an opportunity to join Cisco, take it, absolutely take it, go there, Get your money, get, get a really good paycheck, build up the stocks, get your house, get your car, put your kids through college, work with great people, build up your resume, promote. And, you know, if you make your, your lifelong career, so be it, right? But if you want to use Cisco as a stepping stone to leave, like I am, like I've done, and many, many other people have done, that's okay too. It's, it's you know. There's different paths that you'll take in life. Okay, with that, a uh, pretty long video, but uh, hey, you know, I've got time. Uh, thanks for watching. Stay safe, take care, and I'll see you on another video. Bye.